hear me okay? Yes, okay, good. I wanna start by asking you guys a question. How many of you have had to fill out some sort of web form where you've been asked to read a distorted sequence of characters like this one? Okay, how many of you found it really, really annoying? Excellent. Okay, well, I invented that. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, that, that thing is called a CAPTCHA, and the reason is there is to make sure that you, the entity filling out the form, are actually a human and not some sort of computer program that was written to submit the form millions and millions of times. And the reason it works is because humans, at least non-visually impaired humans, uh, can read these characters, whereas computer programs can't do it as well yet. So, for example, in the case of Ticketmaster, the reason you have to type these characters is to prevent scalpers from writing a program that can buy millions of tickets two at a time. Now, these are used all over the place. It turns out that approximately 200 million of these are typed every day by people around the world. Now, when I first, first heard this number, I was very proud of myself. I thought, look at the impact that my work has had. Uh, but then I started feeling bad, because the thing is, each time you type one of these, not only is it really annoying, but it also takes 10 seconds of your time. And if you multiply 10 seconds by 200 million, you get that humanity as a whole is wasting about 500,000 hours every day typing these annoying captures because of me. Uh, so I started feeling bad. Uh, and then I started thinking, is there any way in which we can make good use of this time for, for something that is good for humanity? Uh, see, during those 10 seconds while you're typing a captcha, your brain is doing something amazing. Your brain is doing something that computers cannot yet do. So the question is, can we get them to do something useful? Can we get people to do something useful while they're doing that? And the answer to that is yes, and this is what we're doing now, and you may not know this, but that nowadays while you type a CAPTCHA, not only are you authenticating yourself as a human, but you're also helping us to digitize books. Okay, so let me explain how this works. There's a lot of projects out there trying to digitize books. So for example, um, the Internet Archive has one, Google has another one, where the idea is to take all of the books that ha have ever been written and then put them in digital form on the Internet. Now, the way these digitization process processes work is that first you start with a book, like a digital, sorry, like a physical book thing. You've seen those things, right, like a book. Okay, so, so you start with a book and then you scan it. Now, scanning a book is literally, it consists of taking a digital photograph of every page of the book. The next step in the process is that the computer needs to be able to decipher all of the words in, in these pictures of, of pages. Uh, now, that's done using a technology called OCR for optical character recognition. Now, the problem with OCR is that it's not perfect, especially for older books where the ink has faded. The computer cannot recognize about 30% of the words, so what we're, but humans can. So what we're doing now is we're taking all of the words that the computer cannot recognize in this book digitization process, and we're getting people to read them for us while they type a CAPTCHA on the Internet. Okay, so next time you type a CAPTCHA, those words that you're typing are actually words that are coming directly from books that are being digitized that the computer could not recognize, and we're getting people to read them for us while they type the CAPTCHA. Now, uh, you may wonder, wait a second, um, if the computer does not know the answer for the thing, then how is it that uh, it can tell whether you're a human or not? How is it that it can grade your answer? And the solution to this problem is this is why we now give people two words. See, the idea is that one of the words is a word that we just got out of a book that the computer does not know what it is, the other word is a word that the computer has already digitized and it already knows the, answers for, the answer for. And then we give the user both words and we say, please type both. And we don't tell them which one's which. And if they type the correct answer for the one for which we already knew the answer, for the one for which the system already knew the answer, then uh, we assume that the user is a human. And then we also get some confidence that they typed the other word correctly. And if we repeat this process to like 10 different people and they all agree on what the new word is, then we get one more word digitized with a very high accuracy. Okay, so this is how this process works. It has been very successful. Uh, today, this is digitizing approximately 100 million words a day, which is the equivalent of about 2 million books a year, all being digitized one word at a time by just people typing CAPTCHAs on the internet. Now, um, because we're doing so many words per day, and, and especially now that we're doing two randomly chosen English words right next to each other, uh, funny things can happen. Uh, so for example, let me show you a few of the things that have happened. So we showed this word. Uh, this is the word Christians. There's nothing wrong with this word by itself. But if you put it along with another randomly chosen word, bad things can happen. So we showed this. <laughs> okay, but it's, it's even worse because the particular website where we show this, this, this system is used in literally millions of websites. The particular website where we show this happened to be called the Embassy of the Kingdom of God. <laughs> 
Oops. Here's another really bad one. Uh, a US politician, johnedwards.com. Uh, they stopped using the system that day. It was not good. <laughs> Uh, and of course, there's not much we can do because you see, for one of the words, we don't actually know what it is. The system does not know what that word is. So there's just not much we can do to prevent this. So every day we just insult people left and right. Uh, and it's funny. Now, this is my favorite number of this project. This is 1.1 billion. This is the total number of distinct people that have ever helped us digitize at least one word out of a book through the system. It's about 15% of the world's population. So this is an extremely large scale collaborative pro process where uh, most people that are doing it are not actually aware of that they're doing it, but they're helping to digitize uh, books all over the internet. So, okay, so now let me t tell you a little about um, uh, the project that I'm currently working on. It's a project called Duolingo, uh, and it, I think it's worth saying uh, where it started. So I started working on Duolingo about four or four, between four and five years ago. Uh, I was in a very fortunate point in my life. I had just sold my second company to Google. It was actually this company about book digitization that got sold to Google. Uh, and um, I didn't have to worry about money anymore. And then I started thinking about what it is that I wanted to do. And uh, education has always been my passion. So I decided I wanted to do something related to education. Uh, so I started this company called Duolingo. Now my views on education have always been uh, very influenced by where I'm from. Uh, it turns out I am from Guatemala. This is a public service announcement. That is where Guatemala is. Uh, <laughs> I have to say this in, in talks in the United States, uh, that there's another important thing that is not where they keep the prisoners, that is called Guantanamo. <laughs> it's not the same. Uh, so I'm from Guatemala. And now, if you don't know much about Guatemala, Guatemala is a very poor country. Uh, and a lot of people talk about education being something that brings uh, equality to the different social classes. But I always thought of education as the complete opposite, as something that brought inequality to different social classes. Because what happens in practice is that the people who have a lot of money can buy themselves the best education in the world. They can go and study at Harvard. And because they have such a good education, they continue having money. And the people who don't have very much money barely learn how to read and write. And because they barely know how to read and write, they, can never, they can't ever make very much money. Okay, so education, I always saw it as something that cost uh, a big gap between the different social classes. So I, I wanted to do something related to education that would give equal access to education to everybody, regardless of their socioeconomic status. Now, education is very general. Oh, thank you. Now, education is very general. Uh, so I, I decided to concentrate on one type of education, uh, which is very big, uh, and it is learning a new language. So it turns out there is uh, about 1.2 billion people in the world learning a foreign language. Now this is a very kind of interesting market uh, because see, out of these 1.2 billion people, the vast majority of them, 800 million of them, so two thirds of the people that are learning a foreign language in the world satisfy three properties. First, the, the language they're learning is English. Second, the reason they're learning English is so that they can get a better job or a job at, or a job at all. And third, they are of low socioeconomic status. Okay, so most people that are learning a language in the world are poor people that are trying to get out of poverty by learning English. That is the current status of the language learning market in the world. Now, ironically, most of the ways there are to learn a language, especially with software, are very expensive. Uh, this is what, what was the case you know, four years ago. So for example, in the United States, there's a thing called Rosetta Stone. It costs between 500 and 1,000 dollars. In Latin America, there's a thing called Open English. It costs about $1,000. They have very funny commercials, but it costs about $1,000. Uh, and so, so this is the irony. It's most people that are trying to learn a language are trying to get out of poverty, but it somehow seems that you need $1,000 to get out of poverty. So it just makes no sense. Uh, so what I wanted to do is I wanted to make something that would teach people languages, but it was entirely free. And this is what we did with Duolingo. So, and we launched Duolingo. We, we started developing it about four years ago. We launched it. Uh, almost exactly three years ago, uh, and it has grown a lot. Uh, and today, Duolingo is actually the most popular way to learn languages in the world. Uh, in fact, so we have about 100 million users in total. Um, in fact, there are more people learning a language in Duolingo in the United States than there are people in learning languages in the whole US public school system. So we have a lot of people learning languages. Um, and people really like it. So for example, let me show you some of the things that people have said. Uh, about Duolingo. So for example, this person said, uh, in the past two days, they've learned more from Duolingo than Rosetta Stone in over a month of use. Uh, again, Rosetta Stone costs over $1,000. Uh, 
uh, or this other person. She was my mother. <laughs> so people really like Duolingo, um, and, and they've been using it a lot. And I'm going to talk a little about what are some of the things that, that we have done to make Duolingo so successful. Uh, but let me first play you this video. Um, so one of the things that happened is when we launched Duolingo, we, we, we decided we were going to ignore schools. We were going to launch a language learning system that was geared towards the end user, the student. And the reason we decided we were going to ignore schools is because Every time that we talked to a school, they wanted us to do something exactly the way they did things. And of course, every single school did things differently. And basically, they wanted us to have a completely different mechanism for teaching languages for every single school. So we decided at first that we would just completely ignore schools. Uh, and Duolingo started growing a lot. And over time, schools started contacting us and saying, uh, hey, can we use Duolingo in, in, in our classroom, et cetera. Uh, and about six months ago, we actually launched, finally launched Duolingo for schools, which is basically um, a program where the idea is that everybody uses the standard version of Duolingo, but we now have a way for teachers to track all of their students while they're, while they're using Duolingo. And um, a f maybe two or three months ago, one of, one of the teachers contacted us and basically told us that she had been using Duolingo, that she had completely substituted all of, their, all of her textbooks uh, with, with Duolingo, and that all the kids were starting to love learning languages. So what we did is we actually sent somebody to, to just film her, say some stuff, and the, the outcome, it sounds like we paid her, but we didn't. So I'll show you some of the things that she said. So let me just show you this, this video. That's about, about a one minute video. Hopefully it works. Can I get audio? Audio? Okay. Everything was so in pieces. So it's just like the way I learned French growing up. Like I learned in pieces, and if you miss something, well, too bad, and you just kind of kept going. That was the teacher-focused uh, method of learning, not really very much dialogue or cooperative education going on. The whole philosophy has changed to make or allow for students to uh, have more responsibility for their own subject development. I couldn't imagine someone trying to learn a language without experiencing Duolingo because it is it is like nothing else. I have the entire school using Duolingo. I have seen grade ones working at grades above their level. I have seen grade eights who never wanted to do French and take Duolingo in their hands and become the most focused students I have ever seen. Textbooks, like looking at the board, like listening, it's not that fun, but we're actually doing something with our hands. Now that I realize the potential for um, learning in this way, I absolutely would not go back to textbook learning. Absolutely not. So that's the, so that's the idea. So let me explain um, roughly how Duolingo works um, So to do this. So this is what Duolingo used to look like. This is our previous version of Duolingo. So you can use Duolingo on the web or on an app. Um, most people are using it on, on an app. About 85% of the people using, use it on a mobile app. So this is what Duolingo used to look like. I used this old screenshot because it allows me to explain things a little better. Uh, but basically, the way you learn a language in Duolingo is that we split up the language into different units that we call skills. So for example, food is a skill. That's where you learn everything about food. So how to order in a restaurant, all the different names of foods, et cetera. Or plurals is another skill. Uh, that's where you learn how to pluralize words, et cetera. And the idea is that at the very beginning, only one skill is open. Only one skill is unlocked. And then you have to complete that skill to unlock other skills. So it really does feel like you're, you're opening up a game tree, basically. It feels a lot like a game. And the idea is that each skill also has this strength bar associated to it. This measures how well you know uh, words or concepts in that skill. So whenever you do something in Duolingo that is related to that skill and you do it correctly, that, that strength meter goes up. And whenever you do something incorrectly, that strength meter goes down. Uh, it's also the case that if you don't use Duolingo um, for uh, a while, the, all the strength bars start going down naturally to model the fact that you're actually forgetting. Uh, but that is also something else that gets people to come back more often to use Duolingo because their strength bars go, go down if they don't use it, so that keeps people coming back. Uh, and now, if that's not enough for people to come back, we actually have a lot of mechanisms to get people to come back. Uh, another thing that we do is when, whenever somebody hasn't come back in a while, uh, we send them our mascot crying. Uh, this actually, we've tested a lot about how to best get people to come back. It turns out that the one thing we've discovered is that guilt is really a powerful <laughs> motivator. We've even A-B tested how many, uh, we've even tested how, how, how many tears this guy should have. 
Uh, and this is the winner. This is the guy that gets people to come back. Um, now, inside, inside a lesson, uh, the, the way Duolingo works is that you basically have to solve a lot of little tiny exercises. And in, in each exercise, it, it's both teaching you something and also trying to reinforce something you've already learned. Uh, so, and the idea is that you're always doing something uh, active with it. So you may have to click on the, on the image that is related to the word, or you may have to speak to the app and it tells you whether you said it correctly, et cetera. And if you do something correct, uh, the strength bar at the top goes up. If you do something incorrect, the strength bar at the top goes down. And the idea is that you have to basically fill up that strength bar at the top to pass the lesson. Now that strength bar is actually pretty sophisticated. Uh, we use a lot of both, uh, uh, basically we use a lot of psychological tricks to get people to get more addicted to learning. Uh, this is something that, um, I don't know if you know the guy, how many of you use Candy Crush here? Come on, you can admit it. <laughs> okay, if, you, if you've ever played Candy Crush, um, it, the idea is that you basically, it's a standard game of threes, it's called. You basically have to get three candies of the, of the same type to, for something good to happen. It's, it's a grid of candies, you gotta get three candies of the same type to, for something good to happen. The idea is that um, whenever you, you do that, a new row comes at the top of candies. Now it seems like this row at the top is completely random. Uh, and in fact, in previous games of three, games very similar to Candy Crush, that row at the top of all the different candies was completely random. And, but the reason Candy Crush is so, one of the reasons why Candy Crush is so popular is because the row at the top is not actually random. It is in fact chosen specifically to make sure that you continue being addicted to the game. So it does things like, it, it makes it easy to get things of three, or sometimes it makes it easy, easy, hard, easy, easy, or easy, easy, seemingly hard, easy, it basically does these sequences of things to try to make you come back more often. We use very similar tricks with Duolingo to give you easier or harder exercises to keep you coming back. So the idea here is not to get you addicted to a game, but to get you addicted to learning. Uh, so we spent a lot of effort on that. And this is one of the reasons why, why Duolingo is so popular. Now, when we started with Duolingo, um, it, it, two of us started, it was me and my co-founder who is a Swiss guy. Um, we had no idea how to teach languages. In fact, we didn't know anything about how to teach languages. I, we had both learned languages. I, uh, English is not my first language, and neither was his, so we had both learned English at a very young age. But we knew nothing about how to teach languages. So what we did uh, is we started reading a lot of books about how to teach languages. Literally, we read French for Dummies. Uh, and we read a bunch of books, and, and what we were trying, of course, we were, we, we're, we're both computer scientists, so we're engineers, and what we were, we were just, we, we didn't care much about philosophies of learning a language. They're very interesting and all, but we didn't care much. We just were trying to build a system to learn languages. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to find what is the best way to learn a language. Surely, by now, somebody should know what is the best way to learn a language. So we started finding books. Um, one of the first ones that we read had a title, something like The Best Method for Learning Languages. We read it, uh, and it seemed very convincing about what the best method for learning a language was. So we were about to start implementing that method when we found another book that had a, a very similar title. It was something like, uh, I don't know, the, the best language learning method or something, very similar title. We read it, but it had a completely different way that also claimed to be the best way to learn a language. Uh, and then we were confused, and it really seemed like all of these language learning books really seemed like the books on diets, if you've ever seen them, they all contradict each other about what is the best way to diet. Some of them say you should only eat meat, some of them say you should never eat meat. Uh, it was the same thing with, with language learning books. Uh, so what we decided to do is we took what we could out of all of these books, and then put out a system. Uh, but then we realized that we were in a unique position, which is that we had a lot of users and we could start trying to actually figure out what the best way to learn a language is with our users. So this is what we do now. So nowadays what we do is um, if, we wanna, if we wanna figure out, for example, whether we should teach you plurals a little earlier or a little later, we just do an experiment. So for the next, for example, in, in this case, the idea would be for the next 50,000 people that sign up to Duolingo, uh, it takes about six hours to get 50,000 new users on Duolingo. So for the next 50,000 people that sign up, to half of them we're gonna teach them plurals a little earlier, the other half we're gonna teach them plurals a little later, and then we're gonna measure which ones learn better. So which ones make less mistakes, which, one, which ones come back more often, et cetera, and then once and for all we can figure out, it turns out it is better to teach plurals a little earlier. And this is just an example of one thing we do, but we do this all over the place. So every day Duolingo is actually getting better and if you use Duolingo, your version of Duolingo will probably be a little different than somebody else's version of Duolingo because we're likely running an A-B test on you, trying to figure out what is the best way to teach a language. And this has been really successful. Um, 
And the City University of New York did a study on Duolingo and they found that if you use 34 hours, Duolingo for 34 hours, you learn the equivalent of one semester of university, which usually takes a lot longer than 34 hours. And this is all because we use the data from millions of people to try to figure out what is the best way to teach a language. Now, um, the last thing I wanna mention is this. This is a new project that we launched, it's about six months ago. Uh, we launched this project, it was, we were getting a lot of emails uh, from, from our users that they, they would say things, thank you for Duolingo, thank you for uh, teaching, teaching me English. Uh, I wasn't able to afford a, a way to learn English. Now, now I, I've been able to learn English with Duolingo, but now I have a problem, which is that I need to have a certificate that I know English for my university or for I'm applying to university somewhere or for my job or something. I need to have a certificate. And so could you guys go ahead and give me a certificate? Uh, so we, we were getting a lot of these emails and then we started kind of figuring out um, how this whole English language certification market was working. Um, and what we discovered was really crazy. Uh, and, and I kind of knew this already, but I didn't realize how crazy it was. So here's the deal. Uh, if you do not know, if, you're, if, you're, if English is not your first language, but you do know English and you want to certify it, it, it would be, it's useful for all kinds of reasons. For example, to apply to, for admission in a university in an English-speaking country, you have to certify that you know English. Or for jobs at multinational corporations, et cetera, you have to certify that you know English. Now, the way people certify that they know English uh, is really crazy. Basically, you have to take a standardized test. There are many of these. One of them is called the TOEFL, uh, if you've ever heard of it. Um, but there are many others. There's another one called the IELTS. There's a few of these. But they all cost, they, they all operate in, in, in very much the same way. They all cost about $250. So it costs about $250 to take this test. I don't understand why it costs $250 to take a test because really it costs about $10 for the company to actually administer the test. But it costs about $200, $250 to take this test. Not only that, uh, you have, the way you take this test is you have to go to a, a testing center, like a special testing center. Much like if you've ever taken the SAT, you have to go to a special testing center to take the test. Um, now, this sounds a little painful. Uh, you have to go somewhere to take a test. That's a, that's, who wants to do that? Uh, but it's even worse because these testing centers only exist in big cities. So if you don't live in a big city and you want to certify that you know English, not only do you have to pay $250, which is quite a bit of money for people in many non-English speaking countries, but also you have to travel somewhere to, to take the test. And this actually, I had kind of forgotten that this happened to me. I mean, I, I, I did remember, but I kind of forgotten. This actually happened to me when I was applying to, uh, to, for admission to university in the United States. I grew up in Guatemala, I had to take a test. I had to take the TOEFL to certify that I knew English. Uh, it turns out that th they ran out of seats for the TOEFL in my country for that year. So I had to fly to the neighboring country of El Salvador to take my test. It, it, in the end, the whole thing required a flight, uh, about $1,000 of investment because of paying for the flight, et cetera. And uh, about eight weeks of preparation for, you know, had to do the reservation, et cetera. So this, this right there, uh, we thought was ridiculous, especially because it, it essentially prevents many people with low resources from applying for certain jobs or from applying for certain universities, et cetera. So we decided to do something about it. So we launched, about nine months ago, we launched a certification program that is uh, called the Duolingo Test Center, where the idea is that you can download an app to take a test to certify that you know English. Now, the, the, there are two complications for this. The first complication, is that we have to make sure that you're not cheating. So this is why people have to go to testing centers whenever they're taking a, a standardized test. They have to go to a testing center to make sure that, two things, to make sure that you are actually you, and you then send your cousin who actually knows English. Uh, or, uh, the, and, and the other thing we have to certify is that you w did not receive help. So you ha we have to certify these two things, uh, and this is, this is why testing centers exist. Uh, but the way we, we actually got, got around this problem, we, we ended up solving this problem. The way we solve this problem is that in the app where you're taking the test, you can take our test from home uh, anywhere. In the app where you're taking the test, we actually turn on the front-facing camera and the microphone, and we record you taking the test. So we, we record everything, and then we record anybody who's saying anything to you. We record your face, et cetera. And then later, an actual human verifies the, the video recording of you taking the test. So that way we can certify that you actually are you and also that you did not receive help. So at the end you receive a certificate. That's the first, um, the first hurdle we had to solve. The second hurdle we've had to solve 
is trying to make sure that this test is actually accepted by institutions all over the world. That's what we're working on right now. Um, so far, the Duolingo Test Center uh, scores are accepted by um, a few departments at Harvard, a few departments at Carnegie Mellon University, and in the next year, about 12 major universities in the United States are gonna start accepting this in lieu of the TOEFL. Uh, and the hope is that in three or four years, you're not gonna have to pay $250 to certify that you know English, you'll be able to do it um, at, your, at home just from an app. So that's the, that's the other project that we're working on. Uh, and that's all I wanted to say, I think. Um, that's it, thank you. I'm done.